Special Operations, Covert Ops, Espionage, The Team House, with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Team House. I'm Jack Murphy, joining you remotely from an undisclosed location in the continental United States. And I'm here tonight with David Park, who you should see up on screen in a moment. And our guest tonight is Ku Stadler. He's the author of Recce, Small Team Missions Behind Enemy Lines. Ku's served in the South African Special Forces, uh, otherwise known as the Recce's which um, he had a, a number of very unique and interesting experiences, but one of his specialities was small team operations, doing two-man recce missions and some of the most hair-raising operations that many of you have never heard about before. So we're very pleased to have Kuz on the show. I've wanted to have him on as a guest for probably a year at this point and been thinking about it ever since I first read this book a few years ago. So Kuz, thank you so much for joining us on the show tonight. Thank you, Jack. Only a pleasure. Absolutely. And we're going to dive right into it. I just got to throw it over to Dave for a quick word from one of our sponsors. Hey, yeah, guys. So again, uh, tonight our sponsor or one of our sponsors is ATAC Fitness. Uh, the people who make these great kits uh, for any of you preparing for any kind of selection or for those of you who just want to stay in shape. Uh, finning is a great way to do it. Uh, they sell these kits. Uh, part of the kit is these high quality uh, hard rubber fins that are vented you know these jet fins open heel um great stuff uh they have sorry they have uh they sell both the low volume kind of high performance mask and also the full volume mask if you want to practice your uh purging and clearing uh you get a little piece of line or a couple pieces of line in it for your underwater knot tying and a snorkel uh you know so that you can one work on your breath capacity work on uh uh, you know, working, breathing in sort of an enclosed environment and also doing your purges and stuff like that. Um, being comfortable in a pool, uh, being comfortable underwater is an important part of many types of selections. And also, it's just a really great way to stay in the state. So check out our friends at ATAC Fitness at uh, A-T-A-C fitness.com. Promo code TEAM10 for 10% off. That's TEAM10 for 10% off. ATAC mm. Fitness. Selection starts here. So, Kuz, uh, if we could start off uh, the way we ask most of our guests um, right off the bat, is if you can tell us about your origin story. I'd like to hear a little bit about your upbringing and what led uh, mm. your path into the South African military. Um, you had a, a kind of an interesting background, actually, studying theology um, before <laughs> signing up. So uh, if you could before, take us through a little bit of that. Yeah, before I saw the light. Um, Jack, I, I grew up in a very rural area, you know, remote and in, uh, in firstly Southwest Africa and then the northern northwestern parts of South Africa, so, so, Southwestern Africa being Namibia today. So um, my father was uh, at the time uh, initially a minister of the church and, you know, our denomination and later um, uh, minister in the in our the black uh, you know what we used to call the African uh, denomination of of his church. So um, yeah, I had a very conservative and uh, interesting well for me upbringing uh, and parts of the then Kal the Kalahari uh, or Kalahari Desert, and um, I got to know about the special forces, the Rekis. Um, actually living there in, in a little town called Ariam's Flay, which is near the border uh, on the Namibian side, when um, trucks and vehicles started running through towards the, the north of Namibia, you know, for the border to, to combat the, the, the insurgents on the northern border. So I saw these vehicles passing through and uh, became interested and um, eventually at high school learned about uh, the Rekis, you know, air, land and sea. And uh, it just gripped me uh, from the very day that I heard it in, uh, in a classroom at school. And uh, yeah, just got hooked then. 
But you were initially following in your father's footsteps, right? Studying to become a priest. Uh, I did because both my brothers, my older brothers, and my father were were you know in the in the service in the church the service. So all three of them were were pastors. So it was sort of expected of me, as the third uh, son, to follow in their footsteps. <laughs> so I went to university to Stellenbosch in uh, South Africa, and uh, and lasted a year and a half, and then. Just went back to actually. I did my national service and joined, um, as, as I described in the book, uh, joined three one battalion, which was uh, Bushmen. You know, uh, the Sun people of South Af of Southern Africa. I joined the unit, stayed with them for three years, and then went to Stellenbosch to the university to you know to sort of fulfill my calling. But then realized after a year that, you know, my heart wasn't there. And I went back to 31 Battalion uh, during that period for what we used to call camps, you know, like um, citizen force or reserve force uh, camps, you know, like two or three month periods. And I would just stay there and not go back to university. So that didn't work out. So I decided to do a special forces selection. Could uh, just backing up a little bit, could you tell us a little bit about joining a uh, 3 1 battalion and you found yourself in the recce detachment there and some of those initial experiences learning about eventually small team operations? Yeah. Um, I had the best three years of my life with the Bushmen. Um, so they had, and we were recruited from, uh, let me just step back one. Sure. We, uh, uh, you know, as I said, we, we were conscripted those days. So I went to then our infantry school, which is at a town town called Oatshorn, where I did my junior leaders and became a second lieutenant. And then we're, I was recruited by 3-1 Battalion. They do all the special units do recruiting rounds at, you know, these, these units, at the leadership units. So... Um, I was, uh, when the, the moment I heard about the Bushmen and uh, the reconnaissance wing then, I, I thought this is, this is my chance. Um, because I was really young at the time, I was 19, and uh, felt, not felt ready for special forces. You know, the demands of special forces those days. I mean, then the Rekis already were like uh, very prominent, very well known and... Uh, as you might recall from those days. So um, so I took the gap and went for 3-1 Battalion Recce Wing. And of course, I had to do a, a selection upon a selection, you know, because you get inducted there and have to do a, a selection for the unit and then another selection for uh, the Recce Wing. Uh, but uh, I breezed through it and uh, and spent three, three years there doing what we used to call tactical reconnaissance, you know, sort of the short, um, you know, 30 kilometers up to 60 kilometers actually into enemy territory where the special forces would do the deep penetrations and the highly specialized stuff. We just went across the border and just the, the tactical reconnaissance missions of, um, you know, enemy installations and, and stuff. And uh, I picked up a lot of experience there, had a, a wonderful time there. Uh, and yeah. But what were some of the more notable operations? Like, if you could tell us through, like, walk us through, like, some of your first um, missions actually, you know, going out on live combat patrols and what that was like. Yeah. Um, I can recall maybe sort of the, the most um, hair raising one. We had to do a reconnaissance of uh, a base of then the MPLA, which was the, uh, you know, they, they were in charge. They were the, the ruling party at the time of, in Angola, the MPLA, and uh, had bases stretching right up to the border, you know, on the Angolan side. Um, but they were also accommodating the Swapu insurgents which was our enemy. So we had to do a reconnaissance of the space uh, in order to determine, you know, whether they 
were Swapu elements and of course, you know, talk in uh, an attack force uh, if we found it to be uh, to be inhabited by Swapu as well. So um, we did this reconnaissance, but not at the time. We, we were not, you know, we did things by trial and error. We, we didn't have a, like, set, uh, you know, modus operandi at the time because we, we were just learning as we went, you know, sort of. Uh, so what we did, we went with an eight-man team with the idea of splitting up on the target and going to different points, uh, which in the end did not work out because once we split up in the target, we got out of range. It's vast, you know, it's spread out. It was like a brigade base around an airfield. So you can imagine at night, uh, our little radios at the time didn't reach. So we, we lost comms with each other. And then, you know, when we ran into trouble, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't uh, communicate. But what happened on that target that night, as we, you know, I was one of, uh, one of the two main teams that penetrated. So as we approached, uh, the one line of trenches on the sort of, on the riverside was along the river line, you know, the Air Force, the, the airstrip, and then the base around it. And uh, not knowing that, it was inhabited, the trenches were inhabited by, uh, by guards, you know, they were actually in the trenches. Um, and the mistake that we made, not knowing any better, we approached against the rising moon, like two o'clock in the morning. And as you know, you know, as you, as you approach the moon, you're blinded, you can't see into the bushes underneath. Even the night vision couldn't penetrate the bushes. So the next moment, you know, this guy cocked his AK and uh, challenged us. I mean, from literally uh, five, ten meters away. So uh, that was scary. But fortunately for us, my my friend was a Bushman and could speak the language. Um, he sort of, you know, said, oh, sorry, my friend, we have, and pretended to be drunk, you know. <laughs> which gave, uh, gave us that split second to uh, just duck down and crawl away and run. But, of course, that scared, uh, you know, that, that raised the alarm because then we started hearing um, shouts and lights went on all over. Um, and luckily, because the other two teams inside heard the commotion, they started moving back and we could talk to each other again. And... Um, had an escape route and escape and evasion plan worked out. So we managed to get out, but we were chased the whole day the next day, just running and anti-tracking and changing direction. And just, just crazy until we were finally picked up by, uh, by choppers. Could you tell us a little bit more about the Bushmen? Because I, I think our audience probably doesn't really understand who they were mm. or that how Reckies were, you know, you guys were not a segregated unit um, by any means. I mean, it was, it was integrated with, with um, black Africans as well. Yes. Yes. We refer to them as Bushmen, which is not an acceptable term today anymore because they are the Khoi Sun people, you know, these short um, brown skinned people of uh, the Khalahadi desert of Southern Africa. So they're not, you know, they're not, we're not categorized as black people, but as, as, as Bushmen. Uh, but if you, if you look at it today, the terminology that is accepted is uh, Khoi or the Khoi Sun uh, people. Um, still all over Southern Africa, but of course uh, today they are um, established in, in, in sort of communities in there. And, and they provided, like, uh, as I recall from your book, like invaluable expertise when it came to tracking and counter tracking. Absolutely. They just knew the land so well. Absolutely. They are hunter, traditionally hunter gatherers. So as you could imagine, and they're really good at tracking, at reading sign, at, uh, you know, they are really well custom adapted to the bush. And, uh, and they were lifesavers, you know, they would pick up enemy sign 
noises uh, just sighing from the bush like like that you know amazing um, and let me say this um, you know they were the unit that i was with they were recruited in angola during uh, operation savannah which was south africa's sort of surge into angola at the time supported by uh, america or some some western states against communist expansion in southern or in angola so when we started withdrawing after operation uh, savannah we took the bushmen because at the time they were suppressed by the, the black people of southern uh, angola they were the slaves of some of the tribes so we started pulling them out and that became the unit that became 31 battalion yeah and really outstanding soldiers the, one of the other things I wanted to ask you, if I recall um, correctly, there's a you had a pretty interesting lion story in your uh, in your book. Yeah, where are you talking about the one where we had the lectures and we put the the lion sounds on? Are you talking about where the lion grabbed the guy in the sleeping bag? There oh. were two stories. Which one? Whichever, whichever you want to tell. Uh. I was I was personally involved in the in the audio in the you know the the, the sound the the, the 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 lion roaring one so I'll tell that one <laughs> you know these little people these bushmen they were sitting in a lecture room now the lecture room was you know from thatched it was a thatched roof you know from from material from the felt you know it was like a very crude uh, lecture room with the benches were just logs and okay we had tables but we were lecturing them on on all sorts of you know at the time i think medical uh, you know, first aid and that but what we did in the meanwhile um, some of the guys went and they rigged loudspeakers with a tape you know those days we played tapes uh, and uh, they had a recording of lions roaring <laughs> And initially, the lion would just give a little, mm, you know, like they do that very scary. Mm, mm. And uh, and they had that set up. And I was in front of the class now, talking to these this classroom of maybe twenty guys. And the next thing, there's this faint lion mm. in the background. Now I could see it going through there. You know, there's something here but not quite sure now their weapons were stacked outside you know we had a rack for the weapons so the weapons were uh, were outside and and they were sitting without their weapons now and and i could hear them saying lion lion and 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 i said guys you know there now this is in the middle of of the savannah region of the caprivi strip at the time between Botswana and angola and i mean there are lions, but not right there at our camp. So I said, hey, guys, no lions here. You know that. And then that lion just broke loose. <laughs> they were like jumping over the, the side of the thing to grab their weapons, you know, and just just grab their weapons and now stood like a <laughs> ready for this lion. And, and the, now this thing was roaring, like really going for it. And they were so scared. I mean, everyone was scared by this time because I was like, here, yeah, you know, it sounded like the lion is, is about to, to, um, to enter. And, uh, and the next moment, the tape switched on to elephant trumpeting, you know, and they realized, hey, we got them. They were so angry with us that we caught them out. They were so angry. They threw down the weapons. They walked away. <laughs> really angry. But uh, we got them there. It was really funny. In, while you were there in, in the recce detachment, there was a, uh, if I recall, a senior NCO who began telling you a lot of stories about the actual recce's, the, the special forces, um, some, some war stories and things that got you really interested in maybe going to selection, right? Yeah, I actually forgot that that was, that was the turning point for me. Yeah, the guy was our um, our unit sergeant major, you know, the, the RSM of the unit. 
and he used to be a recce before, before he became a senior warrant officer. And he was a late legend in, in his own right, but he was telling me about a guy called Andre Diedrichs, who used to be um, a small team operator, and he actually started the concept of, of two men teams, uh, two men reconnaissance missions. Uh, Andre Diedrichs, he was, we called him Diddy's, you know, and, uh, and this guy, uh, Diddy's, he, in the end, he, he had two of our, the, you know, the high, highest decoration for bravery, he had two of them. So he was, he was a legend in his own lifetime. He unfortunately passed away later, but um, this guy used to tell me of, of this guy's, and he had quite intimate uh, knowledge of their operations, you know, and uh, it was just, it was just to me astonishing, you know, the kind of things that they did. And I got hooked there, yes. And so after your national service, it was back to college, back to <laughs> university, but that just wasn't sitting with you. you the the bug said, had been planted in your ear. <laughs> I saw the light, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And so what was that point when you decided, no, I'm, I'm going to drop out of school and go back into the military? Yeah, Jack, it was almost um, sort of, I wouldn't say expected, uh, but in my family, you know, they knew that I, uh, uh, I just loved the bush and, uh, and had it in my, in my mind, in my heart. So I was at Stellenbosch. I broke out of uh, the whatever it was, Greek class, the classical Greek class and just went out to, at the time, at the, the sea there, Gordon's Bay, and just sat there on the rocks and made my made up my mind, phoned my dad and said, look, um, this is not for me, I want to go back and, and join special forces. And of course, he was shocked and he was in a way disappointed, but he fully supported me. My, uh, my father was, we were really close, so he... He, since that day, from that very moment, he just supported me, which was great, you know, because then it was a long journey to finally get to, to small teams. Because, you know, it's now leaving university, it's mm -hmm. uh, initial, you know, the pre-selection, the selection, and then I wasn't accepted. In, uh, it was not because special forces had, I wouldn't say different levels, but of course you had to specialize, you know, you couldn't just walk into small teams, you had to walked it, you know, you had to, to, to grind it out. It, could you talk to us about the selection process that you went through, selection and training? Yeah, the Special Forces selection. Mm -hmm. um, special Forces selection used to, still today, the, the concept was tied up then and it's still the, it's still the norm today in, in our, in the Rikis. Um, you do a pre-selection which you know consists of like um, obviously medical, uh, basic fitness, uh, biokinetic tests, psychological tests, and those. So it's a week, a week of uh, pre-selection, uh, paper and physical and medical. Uh, once you pass that, and uh, normally that would be about thirty percent of you know thirty out of hundred guys passing that. Actually, less than that, maybe. 20 to 30 percent, um, and they would then go on to the what we what we still call today the special forces orientation. And the the simple reason for for the special forces orientation, which is a four or five week course, is to level the playing field. Because you know the guys now come from all sorts of units, some chefs, some air force, some. Um, as I suppose is across the world, you know, they come from all, all walks of life. I came from civilian life at the time, from university. So that was a good leveler to level the playing field and, of course, to get the guys fit and acclimatized. Um, in itself, it's a harsh course because you start with weights of 30 kilo, uh, 20, 25 kilogram initially, walking like 20 kilo root marches uh, that is you know just building up strength during pt mornings and afternoon you know like just continuous uh, strain uh, on the guys and and also there's a fair element of um, you know pressure 
of psychological pressure, uh, keeping you awake, etc. So um, after the selection, uh, after the initial this phase, um, you get a week's break and then you go into selection, the selection course. You know, get a week to fatten up and prepare, and then the selection course, which is um, maybe a little bit different from other countries. You know, like the SAS or um, or even. Uh, let me not mention other other units, but here we do like a week, less than a week. It's actually like four days of real, real uh, hard grind, you know, really hard grind, not sleeping, not eating. Uh, and it consists of a set of exercises where you, you do... You know, like, for example, carrying a drum of water or carrying what we used to call the iron cross, which is a set of irons, uh, you know, like to get put together, but, but designed so that it's really uncomfortable and you have to work as a team. And, of course, individual exercises, a combination of individual and um, group exercises. And you are evaluated by psychologists, a team of psychologists, and uh, Reiki operators, seasoned operators. And so by the end of that, the, those few days, you, if you make it, you qualify as an operator. Uh, but then, only then, your training starts, which, which lasts another nine months. Yes. Wow. What, what did the training consist of? Um, uh, set a series of of courses that we do we do the the courses as uh, you know separate courses so once you've done the course you get the qualification um so if you fall off if you happen to sprain an ankle or whatever you would be you could potentially join the next year or the next cycle uh if you follow me you can you know, you, you sort of build up your qualifications over that uh, nine-month period. And it includes, the first course is Special Forces Individual, which focuses now where the, the course before selection focused on uh, general uh, military, hard, military equipment. Uh, now you would go into Special Forces kit. You know, you get issued with a Special Forces backpack, you do you get special forces weapon all the weapons that special forces would operate with and you do lots of navigation lots of uh, you know tactical exercises but still on a level which is sort of um, i would say like a section leading course you know more more on uh, um, the general military principles when you pass that course you would go on to uh, parachute course, so not necessarily in this order, but basic parachute jumping, then the seaborne orientation at, at our, our seaborne special forces unit, which is for Reiki at, uh, at a town called Langebaan. Then you would go on to um, uh, more advanced courses like, you know, your demolitions course, uh, medical, basic medical first aid course, uh, level three, um, and then uh, final course, oh, sorry, uh, survival tracking, bushcraft tracking and survival in one, uh, which is back in the bush and really outstanding course still today, you know. So we accommodate, even today, they accommodate guys from across the world on that course. Uh, uh, then that is followed by your final, what we call minor tactics, which is your all out tactical course based on you know sort of your special forces requirements of penetration behind enemy lines so it incorporates actually all the courses that you've done until then now right. come together because you get to work with the air force you get to do you know uh, of course close air support operations or or uh, tasks with the Air Force, get to do your medical, you get to do, uh, you get to survive when you do uh, your technical exercises. So it's a whole combination of, of all your training up to then.
did, did uh, they, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, did they train you? Did Did you guys have specializations like in, in today's American Special Forces, for instance? You know, they they have a specialized medic and a specialized engineer. You know, demolitions, things like that. Did you guys have specializations, or was everybody kind of cross trained and equally trained in everything? Um, everyone was cross trained, but of course, after your initial this initial training cycle, once you've qualified as, you know, you've got your operator's badge and your wings and all that, uh, then you would start to specialize. Okay. Now, where we, where we differ from the, that's a good question, because where, where we differ from the American concept is we don't have set teams with a medic, a radio operator, uh, demolitions expert. No. Uh, we work in small groups and you would, you would have a basic team. And in that team, or the team would actually specialize, you know, um, you would ideally, when you deploy, you'd want a medic and a radio operator. But everyone has the basic skills. Everyone right. has, yeah. Very interesting. Yes. Uh, real quick, sorry, Jack. I'm sorry, I was muted there. That's okay. Uh, am I am I doing the read, Dave? Uh, whichever. But hey, uh, yeah, go ahead, Jack, if you'd like to. Okay. So yeah, um, just off the top of my head, I've been drinking this coffee for the last uh, week or so. It's redacted coffee, and I really enjoyed it so far. Uh, let me see. Uh, they are a veteran-founded, employee-owned company. Uh, but definitely not a vet bro br uh, brand. <laughs> They're roasted to order, um, so their coffee is roasted for you the day it's shipped to you. It's a $5 flat fee, shipping anywhere in the United States. Ethically sourced, processed, in an environmentally responsible way. And there are two promo codes here. It's, it is a popularity contest, okay? You can use the promo code Team Jack or Team Dave. Yeah. And either <laughs> one will get you 20% off your first order at checkout. Um, so it's really just uh, which wh whose beard do you like better, mine or Dave's? Um, that's what it comes down to. So you're going to have to choose. Yeah. So, so yeah. Team Jack really or Team Dave as your promo codes. Uh, that's a capital T and J. I don't know if it's case sensitive for Jack and capital T and D for Team Dave. Team Dave. Team Dave. Team Dave. Uh, anyway, sorry. But <laughs> you can see they've got great – it's a great brand. Um Great artwork. I don't know if you can see this. It's the MK Ultra, which is a light roast. <laughs> and then uh, they have the Tradecraft, which is a medium roast. Uh, but, yeah, check check out our friends um, uh, at, at uh, Redacted Coffee. Uh, it's redactedcoffee.com. Uh, and Team Dave for 20% off. <laughs> so... Uh... Let's get into joining a uh, 51 reconnaissance commando and starting to do pseudo operations. Yeah, uh, Jack, after my, uh, after I qualified, um, it was expected that, you know, the youngsters, the single guys would join 51 reconnaissance commando, which was based in the operational zone at Ondangwa, which is basically uh, in the very northern corner of uh, today's Namibia. Uh, the reason being that, you know, they ran short of leader group then, and um, we were expected to, to serve there as, as, as team leaders. Now, what made this unit different was they did what we used to call pseudo-operations uh, or pseudo-guerrilla operations. And uh, it was, was simply you know, acting as the enemy, you know, dressing up as the enemy, wearing the same weapons, kit, boots, everything, and, uh, and really infiltrating enemy detachments. Um, also, the majority of the unit, the guys were turned, you know, switched gorillas. They were captured Swapu gorillas that were sort of either you know, all sorts of ways, either turned uh, with money, you know, they would get a salary, a medical, the family was, would be cared for, 
or um, or by other means. You know, if a guy didn't want to turn, then uh, those days, uh, I can say it now, it's 40 years later, but uh, those days, if the guy was captured by South Africans and he went and it was known and he went back into the communities, he would be targeted. You know, he would be, he would be killed by, uh, by our opponents. So um, the majority of them opted to stay and I had very loyal and really very, very good soldiers from, uh, from you know, ex-SWAPO. Ex and I actually operated with um, the bigger part of my team, like 80% of the team would be uh, Swapo guerrillas or ex Swapo guerrillas, and what we then did, we, with the intelligence that we had, we would deploy into an area. The area would be uh, what we call, used to call, would be frozen. You know, it would be out of bounds for all other military South African military forces, so that we could operate there freely, and not and not be targeted by our own forces. If you follow what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one of the operations I recall, we were dropped in Angola as a team, of course, clandestinely, you know, secretly, and had to cross the Kunene River, all on an infiltration route of the then Swapu detachment that used to operate in that area. And, uh, and we worked it out very carefully. It was after a contact that the detachment had with the South Africans, and they were scattered. So we were following their infiltration route, um, telling the locals that um, you know we were we were part, we were remnants of of the detachment and trying to link up with our buddies. And you know then through the local population, get in touch with the guerrillas and make a, set up a meeting. You know it was scary stuff, but it happened. Now you may ask how with my white skin and you know Western features. But we had, um, we used to call it black is beautiful, but it used to be a brown, like, a, like a, 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 what makeup artists use today, you know. Um, used to color the, the face, I had a, an Afro, you, you may recall the term Afro week, um, I suppose it's still a term. <laughs> but I used to cut it, like cut it short, so it looked fairly, uh, fairly authentic and just cover it, cover it with a hat, you know, a swap or hat. So, um, you know, I would pass within meters of, of local population and enemy without them knowing. And, uh, of course, the, my team would shield me. They will, would always protect me and not let me come face to face. With, I mean, they would, people would recognize, of course, my, my eyes and that. But um, I was never called out. I was never spotted. Uh, and and then the team, they would set up the meeting. Uh, they would, you know, meet the the, the detachment uh, representatives. And from that, you know, the operation would lead either to an ambush or to uh, capturing someone. Uh, so yes, uh, I did that for a year. It was really scary stuff. Do do you, uh, I you said it's really scary. Do you remember your first mission doing that and like walking through enemy lines, walking near an enemy? Do you remember your feelings? Yeah, just scared. Just scared, you know, for the moment they, they picked you up and fingered you. Uh, yes. Uh, actually, the very first mission was this one that I, that I, I just mentioned. We had to cross the Kunene River and we found, because we knew we had all the intelligence, we found the rubber duck. Uh, deflated and hidden under, you know, it was like cached. We found an actual cache with weapons and equipment. Then we found the rubber duck. We got onto the, we inflated the rubber duck and crossed the Kunene River. We had to cross it, um, you know, by ferrying the guys over. And I, I recall an incident where the last boat, the guy had the RPG and the RPG got hooked up somehow the, uh, and it had a bomb in it. <laughs> and it went off on the rubber duck, <laughs> fortunately, with the back blast going into the water. And, oh, my gosh. And the rocket going, Phew! So, luckily, no one was injured. Yeah. You know, <laughs> amazingly. But, uh, but yeah, that compro almost compromised the operation because then the locals asked what happened. And, you know, we had to twist it around a bit. 
and met up with the gorilla uh, group, you know, with me hiding away and the guys making contact. Uh, I cannot and, uh, imagine how stressful that must have been, you know. Yeah, they would, sorry, what, what, you know, it was literally like this. Because you, you didn't, on that mission, we had a guy that was turned a week before. Right. So without him knowing that, we removed his AK's firing pin. He thought he was part of the team and he would engage in a fight, but we removed his firing pin. And, you know, I, I used to sleep away from the guys when we went to, to, you know, into the hide, into the temporary base for the night. I would sneak away, find a patch where there's dried leaves and, you know, like dried grass and that, so you could hear someone approaching and literally sleep away from the team because you never knew, you know. You, I mean, I trusted most of them, but yeah. with a guy like this... <laughs> yeah. were, were there that ever... It, with, with that with that pseudo element, were whether it was yours or somebody else's, were there ever issues? I mean, did the other side try to infiltrate like double agents into that? Did anything like that ever happen? It happened. Uh, it, it happened with some of the teams. I was never involved in a team like that, but it did happen. It happened all the time, and and our intelligence guys, uh, being you know some of them having been part of Swapu before would would always be vigilant and try to you know counter that but it did happen but fortunately not in a, a team that i operated in yeah did it ever uh create like a major issue for any of the other teams where it compromised an entire team or a an entire mission or anything like that no not that i'm aware of yeah. it might have happened but not that i'm aware of what did happen and this was this was another major uh, problem there. Uh, we had a, a unit, a police unit. You, you might have heard of it called Kufut. You know, Kufut means... Uh, uh, crowbar. Uh, crowbar, oh. <laughs> so um, these guys were really, really aggressive. South African, I, I mean, they were our police. But they would ignore the frozen areas, the boundaries, mm -hmm. and just barge into an area. And this, this happened, I wouldn't say often, but it occasionally happened, where they would then get onto our team's tracks, you know. Mm -hmm. And the only way that the team could expose themselves, the white guy would just open up, show his bare chest, you know, twist his cap around with the daedlo on, and just walk out in the open because otherwise these guys were, as I said, they were really aggressive. They, they wouldn't, you know, they would just come in with the Casper vehicles and start shooting and uh, really, really aggressive. Uh, so we had those incidents uh, often, you know, where the team then would be compromised and they couldn't even go back into those areas because it would be known among the population. Right. Would, were those frozen areas, were they static? that they were always frozen or did they shift according to sort of the overall strategy? No, that was the problem. They always, you know, depending on where you needed to operate, they were frozen, you know, for that period. And that was the problem because now it had, had to be communicated to all the military units and the police, you know. Right. And unfortunately, um, some of them would just ignore it, you know, right. just barge in there. Hmm. Chris, could you then tell us about, um, you know, your real passion was, you know, getting to do small team operations. So could you tell us uh, about getting over to Five Recce and, and, and how that you got started there? Yes. Um, this unit that I was referring to now, Five One Commando, was one of the Five Recce uh, Commandos. Mm -hmm. uh, there was Five One Commando then, then Five Two Commando, which was... Uh, an offensive unit, or subunit, 5-3 commando, and then the unit that I wanted to join, 5-4 commando, that used to be the small team, you know, the small team specialized teams. Um, so I, I, that was my mission. I wanted to end up there. But of course, as I said, you know, you can't just walk in there. You have to follow the grind. You know, you have to serve in in the offensive units, I did my time in 5-1 Kumandu. And then finally, I just kept on uh, crying. You know, I kept on saying I want to join uh, Andre Diedrichs. Uh, 
until my unit commander, then uh, Colonel Hills, he couldn't take it anymore. He just gave up. He said, okay, just go, <laughs> just go, okay. And of course, uh, Diddy's was calling from his end because I've been pushing for this now for the best part of two years, you know, asking to join the small team. So, so he was pushing for it to me, uh, for me to come. And uh, then I was lucky enough to, to join at a town called Palabora, where Five Reiki is situated, to join um, Five One or Five Four Commando or uh, small teams. Um, maybe I can just mention this. Mm -hmm. At the time, small team missions, small team operations, or the small team concept was driven by this guy, Andre Diederichs. And, and at the time, all the special forces unit, the seaborne unit at Langeban and the, the sort of urban airborne, air, airborne unit at Durban, one Reiki, their guys came to, to five Reiki. So we centralized the small team capability because it was, you know, it was high-powered uh, deep penetrations was really sensitive mission so we we centralized the, the capability at um at five reiki yes were the were the seaborne teams just using uh like uh, uh, the water for infiltration or were there a actual water operations like ship to ship operations things like that going on also yeah both um, and also you know the typical amphibious operations where um, for example, there would be an offensive action against an oil refinery near the coast. Okay. They would, they would do the, drop the guys by, um, you know, by a rubber duck from uh, either the tech craft or, uh, or the submarine. They would go in, do the reconnaissance, and then talk the, the attack force in. Yes. So and both, ship to ship. Uh, yeah. And and for our audience who doesn't know what a rubber duck is, I mean it's basically like a, a rubberized uh, watercraft, like a zodiac or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah, zodiacs yeah. specifically zodiacs. Yeah, we, yeah. we use zodiacs all the time. I I wasn't I wasn't seaborne, although I ended up later years as the second in command of the seaborne unit. But during my operational years, I was I wasn't seaborne. No. What was it like walking into the, the I guess, the team house for 5-4 Recce and meeting all of these guys who were like legends in your mind and, and you know, really meeting some top-notch professionals and, and that you're going to work with? Uh, Jack, that's uh, an interesting question. Uh, I, was, I was overwhelmed at the time that, you know, I, I'd been accepted. Um, but our special forces being a close community and really small, you know, in, in comparison with others, I used to know, I knew the guys before, you know, and I used to communicate with them and I was friends with them before I even ended up there. Because what, what used to happen, they would come to Ondangwa, where 5-1 commander was, and they would do their deployments, the small team missions from there. That That was where the tactical headquarters for most operations would be. So I met these guys like many times before and, and got to know them and got to sort of force myself in there a, a little bit. So by the time I walked into the commando headquarters and, and five Reiki, I, I was on close terms with most of them. But still, you know, it was like, um, to me, it was just the turning point of my career it was just an absolutely wonderful experience uh, uh, you know opportunity and then uh let's see here let's start talking about some of these operations that you went on because i mean i think they're fascinating and most people here in the United States have never really heard of these missions. Um, like even even people who are aware of, you know, say some of the British SAS missions. I mean, you guys did some really daring, uh, daring missions, and I, I definitely like to get into them. Um, one of them being Operation Cerebrus, uh, where you guys were charged with shooting down enemy aircraft. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that mission coming down and? how you began planning for it and then deploying for it. 
Yeah, maybe I can just give a little bit of context there, you know, the sure. political and military situation at the time, mm -hmm. if, if, if you want. Yeah, please. So, as I've said before, the MPLA was, they, they were running the country, the, I mean, Angola at the time, and their main opponent was UNITA. Now, UNITA used to be the rebel force under uh, Jonas Savimbi, uh, supported by South Africa and other Western states. Uh, so UNITA was situated in the sort of southeastern corner of, of uh, Angola, while um, the MPLA had the control of most of the rest of the country. However, UNITA was also well established in the rural areas in, in much or most of, of Angola. So the MPLA couldn't reach their they're far off bases by road or by rail because between us and UNITA, we just destroyed the rail network and destroyed the roads and they couldn't travel on the roads at all, not even by convoy. So they were forced to fly in, you know, there was a constant like, you know, 20, 30, 40 uh, Antonovs flying from Lubangu, flying, flying from the major cities to the operational area. So as you as you might imagine, you know, there's a little town called, uh, an airfield called Menong, uh, which is in the southeast of Angola. And they had to be supplied by by aircraft, by Antonovs, you know, AN-20s, AN assorted, various aircraft. And uh, I was like, uh, it was like a highway, you know, with these aircraft flying across the whole day. And we targeted those air routes. And that was the mission of Operation Cerberus. We, we wanted to shoot down, uh, you know, one if not more of these Antonovs, simply because we wanted to, we needed to disrupt the air supply. Because they, they supplied everything, you know, food and, and weapons, everything. And, uh, and we, deployed on many of those missions. Cerberus is just one that I described, but because that was my first one. But we um, we shot down many of, of the Russian aircraft. They were all Russian aircraft, flown by Russian pilots and Cuban pilots at the time. Now, I said I need to give some context, but you must understand that, uh, you know, this was to us a communist expansion into Southern Africa. Mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, Russia was the main driving force behind uh, communist expansion. And together with the Cubans, um, they had deployments right up to the, the very front, you know, uh, as advisors, as pilots, as even physically on the ground, you know, as, as advisors to the, to the detachments. And yes... Uh, that that was our target. So we wanted to shoot down the Antonovs. So how how did those um, deployments go? And if you could describe, you know, actually, you know, I, I think on your first operation, you, your team ended up shooting down a MiG, right? Yes, uh, I wasn't with the team that no, not a MiG, uh, an Mi twenty four. Oh, okay. Uh, you know the gunship. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. On that operation, we shot down uh, uh, first an Islander, which turned out to be the. Uh, paymaster, because it was full of Kwanzas, you know, of the Logan, Logan currency. It was just packed with banknotes. And then when they came looking for the Islander, we shot down uh, an uh, uh, AN-24, uh, uh, not an AN-24, uh, MI-24, you know, the helicopter. Yeah. What kind of uh, surface air uh, systems or man pads were you guys using at that time? Um, we, well, most of our anti-aircraft, you know, our AA equipment was captured. It was oh, wow. the enemies. So we used SAM-7s. And then later on, I'm sure you will ask about that. We'll get to the, we deployed uh, uh, SAM-9s, you know, SA-9s based on BRDM-2s. But I'll get to that. Uh, those initial operations, we used SAM sevens. You know, we we uh, we deployed SAM sevens. They were not accurate. They were not nearly 
you know, what, <laughs> what today's systems are. But, right. Yeah. And actually on this operation, sorry, I'm, I, I, I'm disrupting myself now or countering myself, but on this operation, we already used the PRDM, uh, PRDM2 with the SAM9 system on. We had two of captured PRDM2s or SAM, SAM9 systems that we took in on this operation Kilani. Yeah. And about how many aircraft do you think these operations ended up shooting down over, you know, the span of their operational history? Uh, Jack, that's a question that I have never <clears throat> thought of because it wasn't only small teams that deployed. It was between us, UNITA teams that were dedicated to it and Wanriki, you know, the other special forces unit. I would, at, the, at a guess, and, uh, you know, I, I, please don't quote me, anyone. <laughs> I would say at a guess, maybe over the years, between 10 and 10 and 20, maybe 15. I but, had yeah, a, I, uh, don't quote me on it. I, I had a, a contact of mine um, tell me how the CIA delivered a shipment of Stinger missiles to Unita at one point. Uh, yeah. The Jonas Savimbi. And whether or not any of those stingers were used to shoot down actual Russian aircraft is something I've never been able to ascertain. Yeah. Again, don't quote me on it, but yeah, they were used and they were effectively <laughs> used. We didn't touch them. We didn't touch them. I mean, us, special forces, we were not allowed to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, we uh, saw them. Why, why, why were you not allowed to? And, and why were you only using captured systems is that to mask the signature yes Abs uh, Dave, absolutely you you hit it right on the mark all these operations were clandestine non-traceable so we didn't want to leave any sign that uh, south africans were there um and and yes it was sensitive in this in the sense that uh, america didn't support south africa at least not overtly mm. because you know, of global politics, they couldn't become involved in an, the apartheid state, right? Fighting across the borders into Angola, right? But they did support Jonas Savimbi, UNITA, which we like really hands on supported. We deployed with them physically. I was with UNITA teams half of my, my operational career, so we were like this with UNITA, but we couldn't say we couldn't say openly that we that we are using. Well, we didn't use American equipment. You know, we honestly didn't even touch it. Yeah, it's all a, a little, a very um, either unwritten or not often written about history um, that most people are not yeah. aware of. And, and you know, it, as you mentioned, here in America, we often don't talk about it. Um, I think largely for political reasons because of the apartheid regime at the time. Yes. Um, so yeah, it, it almost kind of gets swept under the rug, right? That all of these things happened. Yeah, yeah, those were interesting times, you know. I mean, the Americans supported the the push uh, mm. of South Africa during Operation Savannah, supported us financially, supported us fully, but it couldn't be said, you know, it couldn't be it couldn't right be out in, in the public domain. Right, and and I think that's one of the 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 things that's very complicated about under unless people actually do their own research but it's one of the things that's very complicated about talking about history at that point in time because one you had the apartheid government which was you know not especially looking back from this point in history you know it w was not acceptable and at the same time so much was going on that it wasn't about race but about politics about you know you know the the, the anti-communist expansion and everything true no you you captured it well there uh, dave i mean my buddies my soldiers were all black we were all integrated long before integration became the buzz thing in south africa right so while it was a apartheid we we were like you know together it wasn't race wasn't the issue at all so no, you're very right there. Yeah. Could uh, the next one was Operation Killerney, uh, which involved sabotaging rail lines in Angola. 
Um, this is particularly fascinating. If you could tell us about that operation. Yeah, I'd love to, because that was sort of my, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't say my, my specialized field, but I used to love those operations because it was in the, the very arid desert regions of Western uh, Angola, Southwestern Angola, between the town of Lubangu. Lubangu uh, was at the time the sort of major uh, base, enemy base, you know, with huge airport. Uh, and of course, the main train station uh, supplying uh, or, or with the rail railway line from the coast supplying um, the forces, the, you know, Angolan forces more inland. So what what was again, if I can just give the background mm -hmm. um, from Namib, which is the coastal town with a major harbor, uh, trains used to run inland towards Libangu. And uh, of course, they were all freight trains taking equipment, food, uh, weapons and ammunition to Lubangu. So that was the the main supply route of the forces at Lubangu. And from Lubangu, then it would be taken by aircraft, as I said, uh, forward. So our next target or target throughout the war was to train the railway line between Lubangu and Namibia. And small teams particularly, we cut that line and had it uh, rendered it unserviceable for months at a time. And uh, it was a major hassle for uh, the Angolans because, you know, we just persistently cut that line. <laughs> it, was, it sounds simple, but it was highly sensitive missions then. Because um, what the Angolans did, because Yanita was, was cutting this line, what they did, they put uh, a coach, uh, what do you call it in English, a truck, you know, a, 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 mm -hmm. uh, you know the, the freight truck in front of the locomotives. And the locomotives used to be diesel electric ones. So they would push this thing in front for, you know, if it hit the landmine, then the damage would be relatively, um, you know, not severe. So they would push this thing off the line and open the line up again. And of course, um, they would have soldiers on the next truck, you know, as a reaction force. So it was quite dangerous, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't sit there and, you know, press, uh, <laughs> uh, press your, 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 uh, initiator, your detonator. And, uh, and, you know, it was open fell. It was like flat desert terrain. So it was scary stuff. You couldn't just, you couldn't go, just go and do a, like a traditional conventional ambush. But we worked it out <coughs> to, you know, to the letter. We had uh, an, a company that used to support us uh, from a kit, you know, specialized equipment point of view, uh, called EMLC, stood for Electrical Mechanical, uh, what was that? Uh, okay, but it was basically an engineering company that supported us. And they designed a very clever device. Um, firstly, we had slurry, which is, which is um, explosive that flow, you know, you would pour it out from a plastic bag, it would flow in, in between amongst the ballast and set. You know, after a while, it would become firm. Then we had this device that we put on the, on the, you know, obviously covered under the ballast, but it would react only to the electromagnetic magnetic field, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the field of the, um, the train which was diesel electric. As you know, a diesel electric train, uh, 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 the diesel just generates the power for, for the elect electric motors. So there would be an electromagnetic field and this device only reacted to the uh, electromagnetic field, which means it wouldn't detonate under the, the wagon in front. Yeah. Uh, plus it had anti-lift 
anti uh, light you know uh, light sensor so it was for the time very advanced stuff you know that's and so we amazing. would sneak in at night sorry dave no i was just saying that's amazing yeah for the time it was good stuff yeah and the other thing is you know because we couldn't you had to work preferably very very accurately because these guys would come on the on the line and spot any deviations you know on the ballast if you turn the stones around the rocks around you know they would pick it up immediately because of the coloring of, of the stones mm -hmm. they would see where you have worked you know so what we did is we had a little black tent designed a tent that you would put on the track and it was designed to keep out any light you know so one guy would stand outside and listen you know just cover both ways and the other guy would crawl into the tent and work in white light you know had his lamp on had white light and just work getting the slurry in setting up the device camouflaging it by white light you know to reduce the chances of of us leaving traces and then once it's done we would just take the tent down and uh, and move out now the other thing that this device i should have said this before this device could activate it would activate after a period okay for safety but then it would be it would be lying dormant there for up to three months wow you know before it actually activates wow you know and once it activates it will take the first electromagnetic uh, pulse so it could lie there for and we would set them we would plant three then we would set them one for a week later one for a month later one for three months later so it, it wouldn't activate until that timer went off so they so that's exactly. amazing so exactly so out of curiosity like uh, you know you were cutting off supply lines how deep into enemy lines were you going to do this this was 250 kilos into angola so deep. yeah so you wouldn't have any support you know there was no there was no air support no helicopter could come there um the best you could do is have the mig uh, i mean the our our aircraft the mirages coming to at least give you a little bit of a boost but you know it was they had the enemy had air superiority so you couldn't have our aircraft flying around and you know being exposed to the mix at the bongo plus when we got dropped off uh, we used to fly nap map of the nap of the earth yeah you know, the helicopters used to fly low in drop us off and fly out low and all at night you know because you couldn't dare uh, flying uh, South African aircraft in, in those regions. And, and when you would go in, so uh, like 150 miles into, <laughs> into enemy territory, um, how long would you stay there to, to, like, to, to do these operations? Yeah. Another, another very uh, you know, uh, uh, good question, Dave, because as you can imagine, because you couldn't be replenished, easily you're right we could be replenished but would be another operation you know to replenish so what we did is we would the night we get off we would establish a cache okay yeah water batteries food ammunition medical supplies that would last you anything up to two months so my operations most of them lasted uh, three weeks four weeks or even longer the longest that we deployed was 72 days without without support without resupply all you would do is go back to your cash resupply water and food and just go again what we did later later years this one guy in my book um not not this guy uh, by the way uh, this was the original book the case made book that you have was the one published in britain yeah so this was the original one so this guy victorino um he introduced uh, actually not him he's his colleague which is also in the book my my mate later on he he introduced the system where from the cache we would ferry water forward because the big issue was water right and then food so we would cache uh 
make a major cash, you know, and establish that very well, buried and, uh, you know, all this good stuff, pepper spray and all, uh, pepper onto the surface. And then we would ferry water forward and establish a secondary cache with water. And it took us sometimes going back and ferrying more water in, you know, uh, because as you can imagine, you have 40 kilos to your target now. And it's harsh terrain and it's, you know, really hot, you know, being Angola, humid. So we would just replenish from the nearer cache. And you would go for a week and then go back to your, your you know, your nearer cache. And up to 72 days, as I said. Yeah. And 72 days in the field's a long time. Was that like a, a, a long-range surveillance operation on an enemy camp? Or what, what kept guys out there that long? No, these these were these operations. The, oh, really? Wow. The, yeah, the Opkilani operations. Because, um, you know, after you've planted your your bombs, your, uh, uh, your devices, you know, you would want to monitor what is happening. And, and you would even redeploy and plant another one, you know, uh, to either go off within a day or two or last another three to three months. Um, we had those lines cut for extended periods uh you know and that was the purpose of it so yeah you didn't want to bring the guys back and do another major operation to get them there so it was to make sure those lines stayed offline for yeah. an extended period of time yes it, um how, how many trains do you guys think you guys derailed out on these operations Again, it's it's not something that I, you know, I didn't add them up on my fingertips, but at a rough guess, I would say 10. Mm -hmm. yeah. But and, and, again, and, I wasn't involved with all of those. So that's why, you know, I, of course not. But yeah, I, w I would, at a rough guess, I would say 10. And between us and UNITA, maybe 20. Mm -hmm. you know. So just wreaking havoc in the enemy's rear areas and disrupting those supply lines. Disrupting the supply lines, yes. And these are two to four man operations, like two, uh, uh, two, yeah. two man teams? Two man teams. What would often happen, like on this very operation, we would split up two buddies, you know, two, two man teams and, and do, you know, like go like 30 kilometer out and they would do a stretch of 10 kilometer, you know, one, two, three miles and the other team we do a stretch of 10 kilometer again that's two or three miles that's know. amazing so, i mean it really is just was, incredible when, when was, you finally came out of the field after 72 days one of these extended operations i mean did you look like you just got liberated from a pow camp or something <laughs> i mean like 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 seriously like physically and mentally what was your state like by the time you got back home <laughs> that's another tricky one uh, um um, well, what I can recall, I just wanted to drink a Coke, you know, I just wanted to down a Coke, and that was the main thing, <laughs> but um, uh, sure, I don't know how to, to answer that one, but I mean, of course, there were programs to get us back into the swing of things again, you know, into a normal routine, so uh, it was from the preparation right down to the debrief and the, you know, sort of uh, re re-establishing a routine at home it was for the time i think very um professional you know advanced because even you know beforehand we would work out to the last uh calorie you know your diet right you would work out exactly what you'd need what food you need for the day right and stick to that you know it was really planned to the last calorie um, everything, the escape and evasion, planned into the finest, minute detail. And likewise, your your return home would be, there would be a reception oh, wow. party. You would be reintroduced, you know, over time, taken there's, away to a... There's to a, a picture facility. in your book, uh, if people can see that, the famous five-course meal <laughs> on return from deployment. Was that part of the ritual, part of the program? Yeah, yeah. That was the first one, yeah. You get back and uh, had a uh, like a five course meal, yes. Ba so ba so they wouldn't just send you home to your wife and kids after one of these. It was like there was a slow reintegration. Yes. 
Yes. And uh, even so, even then, when you went home, you would be sort of, you know, sort of reintroduced into, yeah. And, you know, at the time we were not married. The, if I may say that today, the white guys, we expected them not to be married. We didn't easily accept a married guy into small teams for this reason, you know, you'd be away for three months. But, um, of course, the black guys were, most of them were married um, uh, and had normal family lives in a little establishment called Hebron at Five Reiki. And they would go back and, you know, just go back to their, their, their families. Um, yeah, it was, it was tough times, but I, uh, you just adapted. <laughs> out of curiosity, because this has actually been a topic of our show on a few occasions about the lack in American military of reintegration back into society. It's just like, okay, you're done. You know, thanks for your service. You know, you're out. Yeah. What, how would they treat that post mission reintegration into society? What, what were the steps that they would take for you guys? Yeah. Um, Dave, there wasn't a, a formal program, never, ever. And it wasn't talk, talked about, but what would happen is we would go back to, to, uh, you know, our head office in Pretoria. And the initial part of it was just debriefs, you know, uh, close in with our operational command staff, just debriefings, you know. And, uh, I had a number of debriefings personally to the chief of our defense force, you know, on occasion to the minister. And then uh, in some operations, for some operations, the guys would be called together and be personally thanked by then the president. You know, wow. I recall two operations where I was called in, physically called into his, uh, his house, you know, his, his home, his official home, to have tea with him. And it was, I mean, it was tea, but, but I mean, all the good stuff was there, you know, it was just <laughs> Right, right. And, uh, it was tea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was tea. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I had two of those, you know, where the, and so that was part of it, the debriefing away from, you know, you're still with, away from your family. And then you would go back and uh, you would have a week or two weeks just recuperating where you just settled back at home and, uh, and then be called back, you know, or eventually come back to the office. And the initial parts would just be, uh, you know, getting settled into to work again. So there was never an official program, right? but it was, it was approached with very much uh, sensitivity. And, yeah. It's very interesting. Could we then talk about, and I, I apologize if I am mispronouncing this, Operation Claudad, uh, the strike mission you guys had planned to, to uh, Harare? Yes. Uh, as you can imagine, at this time, uh, Zimbabwe was now, it wasn't Ian Smith's Zimbabwe anymore. It was under Robert Mugabe. So this was, Highly sensitive stuff, because if we were caught there, we were spies. You know, if we were caught in, uh, in this country, we would have been apartheid spies. And, of course, with the consequences linked to that. Uh, so, uh, very sensitive, but our targets there were purely the South African, what then used to be our enemy, the African National Congress, which is today the ruling party. <laughs> I have to count my words here, but um, but our target used to be ANC or MK, which was the military wing, Mkontu uh, Wesizwe, and uh, they used Harare as or our targets. They were one, the head office, and then a transition base, which was in a house. So we had actually three targets there, uh, you know, one a logistics facility, one the head office, and one a transition camp in a house. And we, we just wanted to, or had to sort them out. You know, we wanted to cut the supply lines, cut the head office, cut, cut them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we deployed, it was an interesting deployment. We deployed by helicopter, 
South African helicopters flying into a very remote area where agents picked us up, you know, from the old regime, the old Ian Smith regime. They were still agents there and they picked us up, took us to a safe house or a safe area. And, uh, and we deployed from there uh, one night, just drove into three different targets, uh, Didi's, Andre Didrik's and the doctor. They were in the center of town on a little hill and commanded the operation from there. And we just, um, we attacked the three targets. The one was an interesting one, if I can yes, please. share that. Um, oh, Jojo Brains and the, this very guy, Victorino, <laughs> they had the target in the middle of town. So when they arrived there, they didn't realize, but it was very busy. And of course, they didn't want to kill any civilians, you know, and they had to lob uh, a, pre a prepared uh, device into the main office and they had a ladder for that and they wanted to just pitch the ladder, put the ladder up, get in, lump the, the device in and, uh, you know, casually withdraw. But when they go got there, it was quite busy and there was a guard in front of the building and he said to them, you can't park here, you know, just move your vehicle. And they said, no, we, we're going to park here. We need to be... So there was an altercation and they had to sort of excuse the guy. Hey, uh, look, we are here on a secret mission. Just step out of the way. And, uh, they left him, but, and he didn't make any alarm, but he was quite agitated, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and casually old Victorini just put the ladder up with this guy going off here, just making a lot of noise. And Jojo got up, lumped the thing in and they got down and, uh, uh, and, you know, just tell the guy, hey, just move away from this building, okay? It's not safe here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and drove away. So, uh, yeah, the bomb went off and uh, the place was semi-destroyed. What happened on your target? My target was also a, a funny one because we prepared um, to go into the house and around. And I had to do the outbuildings. Um so when we got there, uh, the front gate, uh, yeah, the front gate was open, but the side where I had to enter, it was all blocked off, which our intelligence didn't pick up. Um, so the guys entered from the front, went in, and I and my buddy had to had to enter, you know, via this uh, this obstruction on the side, and we had a hard time getting through there. But eventually we did. We got over it and attacked the, the outbuildings, basically just throwing stun grenades in. And uh, my target, there wasn't anyone. It was it was clear. But the main target, the guys took out. Um, you know, the, there were a few enemy, not not many, but they took them out and removed a lot of a lot of propaganda, a lot of communist inspired uh, pamphlets and stacks and stacks of, of information, you know, just signal stuff. So we, we took it from there and, of course, took it back to our intelligence guys and, uh, and left charges in the house. So we virtually destroyed the house and left. So as we drove away, the police were on their way there. <laughs> and uh, we had the rest of the night then to exfiltrate. Uh, of course, what we did those days, we had a like a spike, a three, three pointed spike. Like you know? uh, a cow trap. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And drop that on the, on our exfiltration routes, uh, which we read about in the papers the next morning, everyone was annoyed, but I then bet. went back to, <laughs> went back to an area where we, um, we, we were lifted by the helicopters. Yes. How, so was, was, go ahead, Dave. I'm sorry. I was just going to ask, I, I, how were these teams, you know, whether it was for the, um, the, the, the train lines or operations like this, was there, were you guys all enlisted? Was there an overall officer? You mentioned intelligence guys who was like setting these missions and how much operational freedom did you guys have in, in determining how you would accomplish the mission that was tasked to you? Uh, there, there was always one of the senior uh, special forces, either a unit commander 
or one of the operational staff at the head office appointed as the mission commander. And he would then act as at the tactical headquarters. Uh, in the case of Angolan operations, that used to be at Ondangwa or at Katima Mulilu or, you know, one of those forward bases in the operational area then, uh, they would act as the tactical mission commander on the ground and report back directly to Special Forces Headquarters. Now, uh, the Special Forces Headquarters, of course, there was the GOC, the General Office of Commanding Special Forces, uh, he was situated there. And he had a direct link to the uh, chief of our defense force, who in turn, for special operations, special specialized operations, would talk directly to the minister. So all of them were right from the top, highly regulated. And so our scope in on the ground was limited to, to doing that. Mm -hmm. Okay, But because we had such very uh, convenient, shall I call it that, uh, lines of communication, we could, you know, you can, could in a minute get authorization to, uh, you know, to execute a mission or change, you know, on the ground. So it was flexible in that sense, but you didn't have the freedom of choice to just kill anyone, do something else, you know, change your mission. No, we didn't have that. But did you guys have the opera like operation control and like how you would do something if they said we want this done and I'm not talking, you know, like mass, like civilian casualties, yeah, yeah. but then they say, okay, we want you guys to plan the mission, brief it back to us and we'll like bless off on it. Yeah. You're an ex military guy. <laughs> I can see that. Uh, uh, Dave, no, we had all the freedom of movement in that sense because it was, you know the concept, mission command. You know, right. you had you had your goal set, your uh, target, uh, or I mean your objective, and how you did that, and how you infiltrated was very, very much left to you. You know, whether you wanted, uh, 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 you know, seaborne infiltra infiltration with uh, submarine or free fall in or helicopter in, that was your choice, you know, based on your... Uh, appreciation of the situation. Yes, that's great. So very, very, very true. What you're saying. It was mission command. It was uh, the mission was left to you as the guy on the ground. Uh, could we talk about Operation Coliseum, which was a, a close-in two-man recce mission that you did? Yeah, love to. <laughs> the guy that I that I deployed to uh, on that mission was uh, Da Costa. Uh, you might have seen his, I'm looking for his photo now, but he was um, my buddy for the best part of my deployments. Uh, you, we used to call him Mr. T. You might recall, a, yeah. you know, BA from, uh, from, what was it, the 18th? Yeah. yeah. And he looked like that. He was a huge uh, and a very impressive guy. He later became Special Forces Warrant Officer, you know, the Warrant oh. Officer in charge. Yeah, he just resigned, uh, just... Uh, uh, you know, went on retirement just recently. But uh, him and I used to operate together for long times. And um, that operation was um, a mission to do a reconnaissance of a guerrilla base, a uh, major guerrilla base of Swapu in uh, the very dense uh, savanna terrain of southeastern Angola and then talk in the attack force. So that was a combination of the two. What made, made it particularly difficult was that we went in with the attack force, which consisted of uh, three commanders of, of five reiki, plus a small element from, our, uh, from a unit that used to be, uh, you know, a, a, a reaction force unit in, and Vambu plus elements of our parachute regiment. So it was like a combination of, of, of units. What made it difficult was we were traveling with the force. Then the force established a temporary base at a forward UNITA base, you know, guerrilla base of UNITA, about 60 kilometers, roughly 60 kilometers from the target, from the enemy guerrilla base. 
It was just gorilla bases all over. And, uh, and of course, they were waiting there for us to execute the mission, come back, brief them, and lead them in. Mm-hmm. Now, we always used to say with reconnaissance, you know, don't restrict me in terms of time. I need time because I can't leave tracks. I can only move, move at night. I, you know, everything that goes with that. So we were doing, Da Costa and I were doing this mission, the reconnaissance against time. That was a catch. And uh, that was a tough one because we ran out of time in the end. But if I can just briefly tell you what happened then from the forward UNITA base, we were taken even further forward. We, we took the chance of moving forward with a small convoy of three vehicles and, you know, a fairly strong uh, force of guys taking us forward and dropping us. About, it took us about 10, maybe 20 kilometers closer to the target. So we had less to walk. And then we started walking. Uh, initially, we took the chance of walking in, in daylight. But as you get closer to the target, you know, it gets riskier. So we, we uh, approached by night. And uh, this is where, you know, by this time, we were more experienced in, in small team work. And this is where our um, sort of techniques came into play. You know, initially, as we approached the target, we just listened out, caught initially explosions, later on shooting, later on vehicles, and just recorded it in on the map. And as we closed in, the picture grew, and we approached the target at an angle, or the target area that we, where we thought the base would be. Instead of going straight, we, you know, we went at an angle so that we would come from the north since, you know, they expected, mostly expected action from the South Africans from the south. We went around and then on this line of approach, attempted to pass the, the target area all the time plotting in just on noise, just on sound. Mm-hmm. Later on, we started picking up tracks, then vehicle tracks, you know, hunting parties, uh, wood gathering parties, whatever they were, and just build a picture. So in the end, you had a, a fairly good idea of where the base was, but, you know, without having seen anything. So finally, Nakosta and I, on the, on the last day, they were pushing us now, we need the results, we need you back here. Because what, what you should remember now, at the back, they are in a guerrilla base, and, you know, it's never secure. Right. The, the Bush Telegraph runs, you know, by this time, the enemy probably knew that there were South Africans in the area. So we were, we were pressed by, by our unit commander. He was the mission commander, Colonel Hills. And it was just, you know, trying to, tr- just trying to get it through. And, uh, you know, before the day that they wanted the attack to be launched. It was tough because on the very last night, we still didn't have uh, a visual. So Da Costa and I then swung in towards the base, you know, which was the intention from the beginning. But we were hoping that we would have passed the base and come in from the northwestern side. And as it turned out, we, didn't, we haven't passed the base yet. So mm. that morning when it, when it got light, we still didn't have a visual. Uh, we knew we were there. We could hear the noises, but it was just haven't had a visual yet. And then he was in front, the Costa, and he showed to me there are signs there. You can hear the noises, so the enemy is there, and we must get down and crawl in. So we started crawling. Now this is open area. It's flat plain from from the river that runs. So we knew okay, this is the river. So the base must be on the opposite side. But we still didn't have the, the actual visual. You know? And now you're crawling. Uh, now. We're crawling. <laughs> and, you know, with crawling, you always yeah. leave tracks. Whatever you try, you know, yeah. you leave tracks. So it's, uh, it was a bit of touch and go. But finally, as we, as we were crawling right onto the river's edge, you know, the, the, in the floodplain, he showed to me, okay, enemy. So we saw a patrol of enemy 
getting out of the base on the opposite side. And then I realized it's right there. I saw the boom, like a boom gate of the gate of the, of the base, I heard vehicle uh, door slamming, people uh, shouting, and actually saw the enemy uh, or the patrol coming out. So at the time, you know, we realized they were doing a security patrol early morning and they would probably do the same on this side of the river set. So we had to withdraw. But, but then we had a visual, you know, we had a confirmation, which was just what we needed. So we went back. Uh, we just sped walk back and hooked up with the attack force, gave a briefing that afternoon and uh, took the force in the next morning. I took the two cut-off, two, uh, you know, the two main cut-off groups. I took them in around the base. Acosta brought in the main force a bit later. He established uh, the mortar base position. And, uh, and by the time we were in position with uh, two cut-off groups, one north, one to the west, um, the attack was launched. And it was successful, although not with the initial attack, attack, because by that time, when they heard, the, when we started, you know, when the attack was launched, the majority of them fled. Two vehicles came out uh, to the west, where I was, with, with the one cut-off group. So we, we uh, ambushed two vehicles. And I think the majority of the base ran north. You know, they got out and unfortunately missed our northern cutoff group, missed them. But uh, in, the subsequent, in, the, in the two days after that, two, three days, we just kept on, you know, advancing to the enemy. And that was where the big successes came in. Uh, we just kept on, kept on attacking, where they reestablished themselves, kept on uh, advancing and, uh, and attacking. So in the end, it was a success. We lost one guy, two guys dead. Uh, one in the initial attack, they opened up with 14-5 uh, in, the, in the ground roll. At that very boom gate where, where we crawled. And then another guy in an ambush later on. Uh, Corporal Mashawavi, he was the first one. And then Corporal Andre Renkin, the second. Unfortunately, he was a citizen force guy. Uh, but yes, uh, all in all, the operation was a major success. Now, how, how does that work for you guys? Because if you're like, you know, you're behind enemy lines, you know, with with guerrillas or, or staging out of guerrilla base, you hit a base of basically the national force, right? The, uh, the national force. And they're falling back. How do you know that they're not calling a much larger force in to cut yeah. you guys off or to ambush you or, or anything else like that? Yeah, uh, Dave, another, that's, that's again, very, very pertinent point. Um, let me just point out that these were Swapu guerrillas. Okay? okay. But as I said before now, we knew that they were supported by the MPLA. So that was the risk now, the MPLA reacting, because this was within 60 kilometers of Menong, of one of the, the major air force bases of the right. enemy. Plus, it was within... I would say 40 kilometers, maybe, between 40 and 60 of a major uh, MPLA base called Jamba. So that was, the, that was the challenge, you know, to get away before the Cuban and Russian, or not Russian, MPLA forces with the Russian advisors could advance. Uh, and that was very, very finely worked out by our intelligence people the time that it would take them to react and how they would react, you know, the routes they would take in. So um, they did react in the end. They did come down, but we managed to evade them by simply going into the bush because they were fairly bound to the roads, you know. Mm -hmm. We just went into the bush, actually ambushed one of, one of their um, convoys. But, yeah, we managed to evade them in the long run, and the, we had we didn't have a major punch up with them. All the the contacts were with the guerrilla forces, uh, the UNITA. I mean, the Swapo forces. Yeah. That, that's incredible because I mean, literally, you are 
what, 30 minutes to an hour away from larger bases that could support these guys, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, we were 10 minutes away from the mix reacting, you know. And the mix were all over us all the time. Yeah. But, you know, with the mix, they, would, they wouldn't, couldn't distinguish between which force is which on the ground. If you had good tactics, you, you know, you, you, you know, moved under the, under the trees. I mean, it's all canopy, you know, it's all thick right. bush. Right. So we had encounters with the mix. You know, guys were, uh, I think at two occasions, they were uh, exposed to MIG attacks. But it wasn't accurate at all, you know, it was just, you know. Kuz, speaking of the MIGs, I'd like to hear about Operations Abduct 1 and 2, which were, you know, your team's detailed to sabotage MIGs on the ground. This was a really unique an interesting operation, uh, if you could tell us about that. Yes, this very base uh, that I was now referring to, Manong, was our first target. Uh, before I joined uh, small teams, the guys did a similar operation to try and destroy the MIGs on the airfield. Um, so that wasn't successful. They, they wanted to basically disrupt the, you know, the MIG, uh, a capability there by lobbing mortars onto them, getting close enough to lob mortars onto the airfield. But it didn't work um, because the challenge here was now think yourself into the typical African situation. There's a there's an airfield, there's a, a, a base, there's a town. Then there are crops, maize, fields, you know, whatever the, they would produce but all around the town stretching as far as 10 kilos further than that away from town so you had people working the fields around town which would made it make it very very difficult to approach mm -hmm. the target because you had to do that you know infiltrating through these these uh, you know fields then getting close to the target infiltrate through the town then get to the actual target, then still face the enemy defenses, you know, get past the guards, then get to the mix. And at the time we heard that the enemy would be sleeping under the mix, you know, they would be physically protecting them. And and this was this was the challenge, you know, to to work your way in there over a period of two, three, four days, just crawling, literally crawling under the ground. And we used to have a technique between this buddy of mine and Didis and me. We would lie like uh, during the day, like, you know, with your head here, I would lie with my head this side, you know, sort of I would cover behind you and you would cover behind me. And the first guy would get into cover and the second one, usually Didis would cover me up with, you know, vegetation, grass, dry grass, just cover me up. And then he would crawl in. I would cover him up as he lay, as he would lie next to me. So you would be static for the whole day. And, and that's a challenge, you know, as you can imagine. You need to pee, you need to eat, you need to drink. And we had tubes running into the mouth. We had, you know, like dry foods that you would nibble on, but you couldn't move because you had people now working the fields. And on this very operation, a guy got into a tree right above us. I couldn't see him because he was here, yeah, but he was, Didis was looking straight into his eyes and he was chopping away at a branch the whole day, you know, not realizing we were underneath him. Uh, so we had, you had this kind of thing. You had shooting all around you with the militia uh, guarding the, the people in the fields. <laughs> so you never knew, but I must say that, you know, we, we trained for this extensively. We didn't leave any tracks. We had what we used to call um, anti-track covers or elephant feet. They would literally pull out on over your boots. I uh, had a, like a leather uh, soft cushioning underneath. So the only print that you would leave would, if you, if you step into a, a sand pit, it would be like an elephant foot, literally. Wow. You know, but... We anti-tracked all the way. We had those things on all the way for the last 
20, 30 kilometers. So every night you would approach closer, you know, like four or five kilos maximum, and then disappear, you know, just cover up and lie there for the whole day. And that was the very, very, the most taxing thing of I, my I my can't even imagine. Yeah, I can't even imagine. Yeah, uh, and the fear, Dave, you, you're lying there, you're shit scared, you know, you're shit scared, but you know, you have to, tonight you have to get up and just move forward and, you know, get to the target. And then the, the big thing was, you know, getting to the target, you had to still have the the energy and the willpower to execute your mission. Right. And then then you get to the challenge of passing the enemy. Uh, fortunately, you know, because it's so far behind enemy line or in into enemy terrain, people wouldn't sit there waiting for you. And they would make fires, they would be chatting. So that was actually, if I can say that, the easier part of this, because you would, would always avoid and penetrate without anyone picking you up. Um, on this this very mission, uh, now that we were almost there, you know, we're on the target almost, um, we had to cross a river line, you know, the river passing the town. So I had my one anti-track cover. At this time, we were wearing woolies. We used to call the, the penetration phase, we put on wool covers on the knees for crawling, on the elbows, you know, for, for crawling long distances on tar road. And we had woolen, uh, instead of those softly padded ones, we had woolen, woolen, um, what do you call it? Moccasins, yeah. you know, pulled over the feet. And I flipped and lost my moccasin in the river because the mud sucked it in. So it's still there, I think, today. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I had to do the rest of the mission with the, on my sock, but... Um, yeah, when we got onto the target that night, we realized something we never expected. They took the mix away. They flew the mix out to Lubangu. And actually, the last night that we, or the last day that we were lying there, you know, in our cover, we, we counted the mix going, okay, there's another mix, they're going. We wonder where, the, where they're going. Not realizing that they flew them out to Lubangu. They never, like, they don't, wouldn't come back at night. You do, know, do you think they, at night. they do you th they flew them out because they be, because of the potential threat to yeah. them? That, exactly. No, there was a by that time there was a leak in yeah. we don't know where still yeah. we didn't know. But the there was a leak we picked it up later that you know after when we reported this, then our aid officer says, said to us, Yes, this is what transpired now. They they were expecting the South Africans to come in, so they flew the mix out uh, for the night. Well, what, happened, morning, they <laughs> what, what happened on the on the second try? You guys recocked and, and made a second attempt. We did. This was the other airfield, Lubangu. So I'll, I'll get to that one in a moment. Let me just one more in, one small incident I want to recall. As we were crawling with these sheepskin covers, now uh, you know on the target, we found. Uh, few helicopters, but that wasn't our target, you know, so we didn't. Back to your question earlier, Dave, of if we could divert, you know, if we could re, re but we didn't. We didn't want to, we didn't want to show that we have the capability attack, you know, a few helicopters and not, you know, and not, not do any right. real damage. Right. But uh, as Didis and I were crawling now to the next helicopter, the next, well, to the aircraft, you know, this aircraft, that we don't want to touch now. Next thing we hear this. Yes, we got a serious fright. Eh? What's this? So we went, we went low. And the next thing, within like six, seven meters from us, there's a dog running. <laughs> you could hear his, and he didn't pick us up. He didn't, nothing. Just passed us. So it shows you, you know, it can be done. You can, you can bullshit the dogs even. Uh, that's right. <laughs> you must have smelled so bad at that point. They just thought exactly. you were part of the bush. Kuz, I, I just want to point that, out. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to point out because I know you. We know that you are on a timeline. That uh, it's we're at the ten minute mark from from two hours, and we don't want to make you late for your next thing. Yeah, I, I, that's why I want to jump into the second one where you guys actually clipped the wire and went inside the airfield. Yeah. 
Yes, this was Operation Abduct uh, 2. So we, uh, we, this was the major Air Force Base Lubangu. And Lubangu at the time was considered the best uh, air defense, you know, in terms of air defense, it's the best um, base in, in Africa, Air Force, uh, you know, the best protected. Um, and also physically, you know, by that time they expected the, the South Africans to, to target the, uh, the aircraft. So again, we had to penetrate, you know, really walking at night uh, barefoot. We did a lot of barefoot walking, stepping in human and dog shit, and you know, had a lot of that. And, uh, and finally reached uh, the area overlooking Lubangu, which is to the sort of southwest, where if you Google it, Kirstu Rai is, which is a, a smaller version of the, uh, you know, the, the statue of Christ at, uh, at, at, at uh, in uh, Rio de Janeiro. But in any event, we watched the target for a few days. Um, very scary because at the time they were patrolling uh, the, you know, the high ground south of, of Libangu. And eventually we were caught out by some ladies collecting wood. Because what we didn't realize, you could see on the aerial photos it was canopy. But they have cleaned out completely the undergrowth. So there wasn't any place to hide. Right. Nothing. You know, we, we couldn't hide. Uh, we could climb trees, but, you know, not with your pack and that. So eventually we were caught out by some ladies collecting wood and kids. But of course, I chased them away, but we had to move out. And we moved out and we, we hid in a, like a, a, a reed, what do you call it, a marsh, a marsh, a thicket, you know, of, yeah. of reeds. That was the only cover. Uh, and instead of watching the base for, like we intended to for a week, we decided to go in that night and we got permission from the head office to just go in because, you know, before they could raise serious alarm. And we, we, we did. We approached the base from the south. We cut, uh, uh, you know, after the patrol has passed, we measured, you know, we lay there for an hour. After the patrol has passed, we cut the fence. Uh, da Costa, we, he was left on the mountainside so he could talk back to the HQ. Didis and I went in, cut from the fence we had to penetrate another one and a half kilos, you know, 1,500 meters to the aircraft. We got to the mix, uh, saw the MiG-21s lined up where they should be, because that intelligence was good. We saw the area where the MiG-23s were, but we, at that time, we would start with the MiG-21s. And again, we had devices, similar to the one I was talking before, really good stuff. We plant under the, the wing and it would activate, uh, well, within 30 minutes, but uh, they would be set then to all go simultaneously the, the, the next, well, after that. So when I started, Didis was, he stayed in, a, in, in cover and I approached the first one, you know, and we had, kit designed for that, I could take the, the charges, you know, like this. I could take the charges from a specially designed pack. I took my charge, approached the aircraft, and the same thing as before, the guy, they were sleeping under the aircraft, couldn't see them, not even with the night vision. It's just too dark. And the guy challenged me, you know, cop the AK, what are you doing here? Now, part of our preparation at the time was to learn Portuguese phrases so that you could counter situations like this. And that fortunately kicked in immediately. I started speaking in my limited Portuguese, pretending to be drunk. Hi, comrade. Um, yeah, you know, pretending to be just not in my place. And uh, managed to slip away with them without them. Just went down. It just went low immediately and crawled out without them starting a uh, fire. Because, you know, you can imagine, they wouldn't know who it is. Right. They wouldn't want to shoot one of their own. And that was drilled into us, you know. Uh, enemy in their own bases, they don't just start shooting. Right. They, uh, they need to establish who you are. So I got back to Didi's and, uh, and, you know, we had to gap it. 
because very soon they started with searchlights, uh, vehicles driving up and down. Uh, on the perimeter, they came around. So we just kept it and fortunately just made it out. As I opened that compass, it was like to just run. And we got to the, the cut part in the fence and, and managed to get out. And before first light, we were back on the mountain with uh, the Costa. And so unfortunately, not successful, but some experience. That's incredible. Absolutely. I mean, it was a very daring operation, oh. to say the least. And you guys came very close to completing it. Um, yeah. You know, the, if they had a guy sleeping under each aircraft, I mean, sure, even if you had a suppressed pistol, I mean, I think you're only going to make it so far, right? <laughs> um, but we didn't have time to talk about everything. We have to let you go, Coos. And that's fine because you wrote the book, yeah. Recky, Small Team Missions Behind Enemy Lines, yeah. by our guest, Coos Stadler. I really highly suggest all of you guys go out and read it. This is one of my favorite special operations memoirs. And it's about a subject matter that is, there's not a lot of books out there about this. So I really hope that you guys will go and check it out. We, we have a um, cu couple of questions that we, that we should get to real quick. A couple of your questions. If you can answer these quickly, Coos. First off, Isaac asked, uh, uh, did you or anyone you knew of fi uh, find any Cubans or Russians in Angola? Um, I didn't. And neither one of my teams did. But we saw, you know, you, you, would saw, you would see when you lie in your, your OP watching Lubangu or whichever target, you would see, oh, there's a white guy. You knew that the pilots were Cubans or Russians. But I didn't physically encounter anyone, no. Yeah. I knew that with some of the operations where we actually entered uh, the, the bases, the, you know, the, the towns, the guys picked up uh, Russians, actually brought them home. Uh, they were, I mean, those were all recorded, but I was never part of that. No. Um, uh, Patrick, thank you very much. Asked, what comms with talk did you uh, have on small unit ops? Like, what kind of comms were you guys using at that time? We had the Sinkel 30 that had a hopper capability, uh, Raycol, Raycol Sinkel 30, uh, HF. So, HF, back to Tech HQ, it would be HF all uh -huh. the way. You know, no, we didn't have set phones and that sort of thing yet. Yeah. Uh, so it was all HF, very reliable systems, though. Uh, and we had, for the batteries, we had solar. Later on, we had solar panels. So we could go for extended periods on, on a battery or two batteries. Um, and inter-team or inter-body in the team, you know, inter-team, we had um, mostly, at the time, A84s, which was a tactical radio. Uh, I suppose American, I'm not sure. And and also we had TAC BE, BE 499s, which was a tactical beacon, but it also had a ground to it, you know, for very close interbody, you know, for emergencies. Yes. Interesting. And then Hassan, thank you very much. He said, what did, what did you think or what was the general opinion of like um, EO executive outcomes uh, and their contract you know, against, with the Angolan government against UNIDA, UNIDA or UNIDA? Yes. Um, look, that was, that was after the war. That was after, I mean, after we have withdrawn. Mm -hmm. It was still civil war. So, um, to be really honest, I had mixed feelings about it because at the time, you know, the war was over and UNIDA should have, should have given it up. So, um, yeah, I, I wouldn't say that I supported uh, EO. And I wouldn't say that I was against them. Uh, I think they did a job then that was needed. Right. Uh, and that Savimbu had to, he had to give in. He had to give way eventually. So, yeah. Yeah, that, said, that, uh, that's really experience. interesting so, too. Because, I mean, basically at that point in time, they were just denying the elections. Regardless of what you thought of the elections, correct. they were denying them. Right. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Kuz, thank you so much for doing this tonight. It's really been a pleasure. And after reading your book years ago, I'm so glad that we've been able to have this conversation. And I really appreciate you sharing these experiences with us. Thank you very much, Jack. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, great opportunity. And Dave, thank you very much. Interesting questions. Thank you, Kuz. We really appreciate it, man. Uh, next week, join us. Our guest on the show is going to be former CIA officer Rick Prado. Uh, so I hope you will join us next Friday. And he has a, a very interesting career. Looking forward to talking to him then. 
And um, I think that's all we got. I think that's pretty much a wrap, right, Dave? Yeah, like, subscribe, and buy Koos's book. Uh, Recky, you can find it on Amazon. <laughs> Check it out. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And thank you, Koos. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.